Thank you for taking the time to listen to this message by Pastor Josh Cotts. We pray it blesses and encourages you throughout the week. If you'd like to know more about Living Word Church and the ministries associated with it, please visit our website at livingwordshawnee.org. So it was kind of sudden, uh, we, we kind of told ourselves, we used to do fasting every year, and we kind of told ourselves, the leadership team, that we would start waiting until we have a purpose for it, instead of just doing it every year. And I'm not saying that it wasn't powerful, because we had some powerful moments during those seasons of prayer and fasting. Um, but there is a purpose right now, and I'm going to outline that for us today. I'm going to give us some clear vision for going forward. Again... Um, we will not be scrutinizing you and, and making sure that you're doing this, but I wanna, really want to highly encourage you to do it because it, it can be really powerful. Um, and, and encourage you to be here at least for the night prayer times that we have here at 6 o'clock in the sanctuary because I know that they're going to be powerful as well. Um, <clears throat> but I want to give us a little bit of a background on prayer and fasting. Normally when we call for prayer and fasting, we just kind of assume and, and I think it's, we, we rightfully assume it because you guys are smart and you guys are believers and you love Jesus and, and you read the word, right? <laughs> so, so there's not really any need for that. But I felt like I needed to go ahead and just talk about the background just for this first part of prayer and fasting, why we do it in the first place and what it's for. It's not about just forgoing food. That's not what fasting is about. Um, if you look, if you know the word, you know that fasting is almost always accompanied by prayer. It's, it's not really ever they just fasted. It doesn't really ever say that. It usually says they fasted and prayed. It's almost always accompanied with prayer. So what that tells us is that prayer is actually the purpose of fasting. Does that make sense? We fast for prayer. When we fast, it's not so that we can look better to God. It's not so that we can look holy to God. Okay? A lot, you, you see a lot of people who, they'll fast, and then they eat something, and they're like, oh, no, I, I totally messed up everything. Now God's going to hate me for this, you know, or he's so mad at me because I, I ate. No, it's not about that. Fasting doesn't make me holier. Um, just looking in Scripture, you, you can't really say, you can't really look in here and find a really like good description of why people fast, but we do know that it's always accompanied by prayer. Amen? It's always accompanied by prayer. So this tells us that prayer is actually why we fast. Okay? Fasting is not a way to get God to answer our prayers. Okay? When you fast, it doesn't go, well, God's not up there going, well, since you're fasting, I'll answer your prayers. We can't manipulate God. We can't do that. And there, there is a belief that if I fast, then God's more likely to hear my prayers, but we can't manipulate him in any way. If we try, and if we are trying to manipulate him, it won't work. He's just going to do what he wants. The word tells us that. Amen? But it's not a way to get God to answer our prayers. It doesn't convince him that I'm holy enough and deserving enough for him to answer my prayers. What it does do, though, is it changes how I pray. It changes how I pray, it changes what I pray, it changes how often I pray, okay? That's what fasting does because what's supposed to happen whenever I'm fasting, especially if you're fasting food, what's supposed to happen is as soon as you start to feel hungry, it's supposed to remind you of why you're doing it and then you pray, right? That's really what it is. And so really the purpose of fasting is to bring into submission something that, is, has, that has control over me usually and to actually allow it not to control me anymore but to serve me. And hung, this is why we fast food a lot of times when you hear about fasting. It's food because hunger controls you, right? How many of you feel hungry right now? Yeah. And hungry will control your thoughts. At noon, you will probably start thinking about what you want for lunch, if you're not already. 
right? <clears throat> it does control us. But the purpose of fasting is to bring something like hunger into submission so that it can serve us to empower us and strengthen our prayer life. That's the purpose of it. Amen? The fasting that we read about in the Word was done by giving up food, but it's actually more so just a denial of self. It's a, de- it's a denial of the things that I feel like I need all the time. And so it could be, like we've asked, called corporately for fasting in the past, stay off social media. Unfortunately, I got on social media after the fast, and I noticed not everybody stayed off social media. <laughs> um, so we, we've had that. We've had stay away from media in general. We've been like, you know, just fast one meal a day. We've called for things like that. But it's, more, it's less about what you're fasting, and it's more about why. It's less about what you're fasting, and it's more about why. What you're fasting, you're fasting because it has control over you. It somehow controls your actions and your thoughts. It influences you in ways that God should be influencing you, right? So we let go of that thing to allow God, God that area of our lives. It means giving up something that I have a tendency to depend on more than God. And, and here's the deal. Whenever I start depending on things that are not about God, whenever I fast those things, just imagine what that does to your prayer life because it starts to change your prayer life from being about you and now it's about God instead right? So it completely redirects my focus. Fasting is supposed to. If you're not doing it for the right intentions, it won't redirect your focus. It'll just redirect your focus to your stomach or to whatever it is that you're giving up, right? But if you have good intentions behind it, which our intention right now is to pray for our nation because our nation needs Jesus. Our nation needs prayer. Amen? These are good intentions, but when they're not good intentions, I'm just going to be thinking about how hungry I am. Without a God-centered purpose, fasting is just a miserable, self-centered event. It really is. It's so miserable. I didn't read anything in here about people saying that fasting was miserable. Why? Because they always had a God-centered purpose behind it. It was always about Jesus. It was always about God, right? Right? It was always about redirecting our focus to to him in here. And so without that God-centered purpose, it it really is just miserable. And all you do is you think about how long it's going to be until you're done with this fast. If you're thinking about how long it takes until you're done with a fast, you're thinking about the fast. You're not thinking about God. You hear me? You're thinking about what you're giving up. Every time I feel the ache of whatever I'm giving up, all I think about is that thing or how much longer I have until the fast is over. But with a God-centered purpose, I actually bring whatever I'm giving up into submission and it serves me by strengthening and changing my prayer life. Amen? So everyone say, fasting is for prayer. I bet Pastor Cliff will like that. I'm sure he's watching right now. He's in the bedroom going, amen. (laughs) Amen. Uh, let's, show, let's look at Matthew chapter 9. I'm just going to go through a couple of examples real quick of times that they fasted, and we're going to make some connections real quick uh, for where I want us to go whenever we go into this time of prayer and fasting. Matthew chapter 9, and I want to start with verse 14. <clears throat> Matthew 9, 14. It says, Then the disciples of John came to him, Jesus, asking, Why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, The attendants of the bridegroom cannot mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them, can they? But the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. Amen? You know that? Now, he says, what Jesus basically says is, because since I'm with them, he actually indirectly relates himself to this term, this noun, bridegroom, because he is the bridegroom. And he says, while I am with them, they, they shouldn't be fasting because there's no reason to mourn. Now, what this tells us is that fasting was traditionally associated with mourning in biblical days. 
You even read about Nehemiah whenever he found out that Jerusalem's walls were broken down. He says that he wept and he fasted and prayed. Most of the time when somebody passes away that we love, we don't eat a whole lot. We lose our appetite. It's kind of a natural thing for fasting to go alongside mourning. But it's traditionally associated with mourning, especially in, in biblical times. It was an expression of brokenheartedness and desperation. And it was something that people would do when they needed to see breakthrough. We, they would fast during a time of mourning so that they could see breakthrough in whatever is causing the, the mourning season, right? <laughs> we were just talking about that with some friends the other day. <laughs> I'm usually like, I'll wait, it's okay. Um, <laughs> So it was something that, fasting was something that people would do when they needed to see breakthrough. <laughs> We're doing it again, huh? <laughs> I'll wait, it's okay. <laughs> we should start fasting our phones. Might be good. <laughs> I, I can't tell you, like, we, we'd all probably just like lay over and die if we had to give up our phones. I know some of us are probably not thinking that. But anyway, fasting was traditionally associated with mourning. And it was something people would do when they needed to see breakthrough. But the thing is, even though it was usually done during times of mourning, there was actually intention behind it. It wasn't just we're sad, so we're not going to eat. There was intention behind it. There was, we're going to redirect our eyes to God now. That's why we always read fasting and praying. Just fasting is just giving up something. But fasting and praying is giving up something and giving God that place. Right? So it's always associated with prayer. But there was always intention behind it. It was more than likely done to get a person's eyes off of themselves and their own desires and onto God's heart. So right here, Jesus says, they won't fast right now because I'm with them. But after I'm not here anymore, they'll fast. So there's an association here with fasting and Jesus not being here. So why do we fast? Because we need Jesus. Plain and simple. Why would we want to fast right now for our nation? Because we need Jesus. Amen? Amen? And I, man, if there is a time of, of mourning, if that's what you call it, want to call it, it's right now. There are things going on in our nation that need to end and need to change. And here's the deal. Sometimes we don't see Jesus in a situation. And I, I think it's, it's less that we want Jesus to show up and it's more that we want to be able to see him working in the midst of this, the situation. Because I don't think that God just straight up leaves. I don't think he's just abandoning everything and being like, whatever, I'm done. I don't think that that's happening. There'd be no reason to send a son named God with us if that was the case, right? So I don't think that that's the case. I think fasting is less about inviting Jesus in and it's more about opening my eyes to see where he is so that I can point him out in the situation and I can call that out, I can declare that, amen? So if I don't see Jesus, here's the deal, if I don't see Jesus in a situation, it's not always, it's rarely because he's not there. Many times it's just because I'm looking for myself in the situation instead of looking for Jesus. And this is why we fast. I will fast to make it not about me anymore so that I can see Jesus. Because all I can see right now is me. I'm looking for solutions. I'm, lo I'm looking at my sadness and my depression and, and why, you know, bad things that are happening to me. And if I can just fast and give this thing up and pray and direct my heart toward God, then he'll show me Jesus in the middle of my situation instead of me looking at myself. Amen? Matthew chapter 17. And I want to start with verse 14. <clears throat> Matthew 17, verse 14. 
It says, when they came to the crowd, a man came up to Jesus, falling on his knees before him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic and is very ill. For he often falls into the fire and often into the water. I brought him to your disciples and they could not cure him. And Jesus answered and said, you unbelieving and perverted generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked him and the demon came out of him and the boy was cured at once. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, why could we not drive it out? And he said to them, because of the littleness of your faith. For truly I say to you, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move and nothing will be impossible to you. But this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. So the disciples could not cast the demon out of this boy. Apparently they were trying and they were trying. They couldn't get it to happen. And they come to Jesus and they're like, why couldn't we cast it out? Jesus says, because of the littleness of your faith. But then he says, it doesn't go out except by prayer and fasting. So which is it? Is it because of the littleness of your faith? Or is it because they needed to pray and fast? It's because of both. There's an association that Jesus makes here. It says, when I pray and fast, it will increase my faith to see God move and to see the impossible happen. Because when I'm looking at myself, obviously nothing's going to happen there because I can't accomplish anything without God. Right? So when I pray and fast, it increases my faith. And here's the, here's the great thing. It only has to be a mustard seed. How insulting was that for Jesus to say your faith was little and then say if you had faith the size of a mustard seed, you could do it. That means that their faith was smaller than a mustard seed, right? And there's, there's a lot of symbolism you can go into there, but there's an association here with prayer and fasting and faith. Prayer and fasting actually increases our faith. How does it increase our faith? When I fast... I give God control in an area that has control over me, right? Are you with me? There's a lot of movement, lots of distraction, so let's stay focused this morning. When I, when I fast, I give God control in an area that has control over me. So it increases my faith because my faith, hear me, is not something that I use to make God do stuff. Faith is not a tool that you use to manipulate God into doing your bidding. (laughs) That is not what faith is. And the faith movement, I feel like at some point, um, and, and I know that not everybody's like this, but the reason faith healers, they're called faith healers, get so much criticism is because that name has been tarnished because people have used faith to manipulate God. They've been like, if I can just pray in faith and believe in faith, God will do this, whatever I want. But then elsewhere in the word, it tells us our prayers aren't getting answered because they're what we want and not what God wants. So obviously, faith goes in line with what God wants. Do you hear me? So faith is not something that I use to make God do stuff. So when I fast, I give God control in an area that has control in me, over me. So it increases my faith because my faith is not something that I use to make God do stuff. My faith is my ability to allow God to be in charge of a situation. Amen? My faith is my ability to allow God to be in charge of the situation. This is how it's linked in, to fasting. Because when I fast, I let God be in charge of something that's in charge of me. Amen? When I give God control over something that controls me, I train myself to trust him. So it increases my faith when I fast. As long as it's a God-centered purpose. Now the purpose of the corporate fast. I know this is a lot of information. We're going to get into the meaty stuff here in just a second. But the purpose of the corporate fast is to unify ourselves to one vision. We call for a corporate fast so that we can all stop thinking about ourselves, right? We actually can't be unified with God when we're just thinking about us, amen? 
So when we fast together, when we do it with one vision, one purpose, and we're all going the same direction, we actually all are not thinking about ourselves anymore, and we unify ourselves to God's purpose, and we become even closer as a family. Amen? So that's why we call for a corporate fast. I know, you know, times in the past when I was younger and I didn't understand what fasting was all about, you know, pastors would call for a corporate fast, and I'd be like, I don't have to do that. You know, I don't, need to do, I don't have to do what you tell me to do. You know, that kind of thing. We've all been there. Okay, if you haven't been there, let's talk because I need to know how you did it. But no, when somebody tells you, hey, don't eat for 40 days or whatever, or however long, you're like, no, I'm not going to do that, right? But there is a purpose behind the corporate fast. There is something that happens, and I promise you, if we all do this together, there is something that will happen, explosive just in our body here. There's something that will happen because it will bring us closer together as we're getting closer to God's purpose. Amen? So I want to encourage you in that. Now, getting into this next part, it's going to be heavy, but it's going to be good. Everybody say, it's going to be heavy, but it's going to be good. Now, whenever the Lord brought this on me and told me, I I want you to fast, I want you to call for a fast, he told me nine days. And when I first heard that, I just thought, what a random number. It was the most random thing. But I said, okay, God, I'll call for nine days. Normally it's 10 or 30 or 40. It's like an even number, you know. But nine, it's kind of (laughs) weird. And uh, so I just said, okay. And then the other day, Bailey was reading a book. And in it was a... the, the author was talking about Abraham Lincoln. And during the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln called for nine days of prayer and fasting. Is that not crazy? I didn't even know that. But during the Civil War, do you understand what's going on in our nation right now? And he called for nationwide nine days of prayer and fasting. So... <laughs> That's not to say, look at me. That's to say, God knows what he's doing, right? He knows what he's doing. And and for me to think that's just a random number, no, there's some, there's something, there's something to that. Amen. But, but if, if there's something that I could use, if there's a little bit of information I could use to maybe encourage you to participate in it, in this, it's that, um, there, there is obviously there's a confirmation there. Okay. There's a lot of turmoil in our country right now. And there's a lot of division. And there's a lot of anger and bitterness and strife, conflict, hatred, criticism. It's just all over the place. And it's being exposed more and more by the minute. It's just, it just feels like it's just growing and intensifying. And every day you look at the news and it's just, what do we have today? What's going to happen today? I want to come out front just in this body and just say racism is evil. It is straight up demonic. There is no doubt about that. It is, it is evil, Okay. There is absolutely no reason we should ever think a racist thought. There's no reason we should ever feel anything racist or do anything racist. There's absolutely no reason as a body of Christ we should ever participate in that spirit of division. No reason. And I'm taking a stand and I'm saying that that spirit cannot come onto this campus. I'm not, I do, it's not going to. We are shutting the door to that, okay? I'm not sorry if that offends you. (laughs) Now, I want to say this. What's going on in our nation is not because of racism. It's not. 
The word tells us what's going on in our nation. It's not because of racism. But I will never, ever say that that is something that is to be taken lightly. That is something that needs to die. Racism needs to die, right? But what I want to say today, I want to give us direction. We are not going to be praying just against racism for this next nine days. We are going to be praying for something, whatever is influencing and inspiring racism. We are going to, to be praying for wherever that evil, nasty thing originated, for that thing to die. Amen. For that root to shrivel up and dry up and just die. Now, what's happened is we have tried to tackle this issue for a long time. A long time. We have enacted laws. We have made speeches and statements. We have elected a president. And it has not fixed the issue. That's because it goes much deeper than that. There is something that is feeding that issue that needs to stop and needs to die. Amen? Amen. So I want to look at Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, and I want to start with verse 10. Ephesians 6.10 says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, and against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Did you know your struggle is not even against you? It is what, is what is influencing you away from God. When you talk about beating the flesh, what you really need to think about is what is influencing your flesh, what is feeding your flesh, and that needs to be targeted. Right? You need to think about that. It's not enough to just chop the fruit off the tree. The tree needs, the tree needs to be chopped down. And I think that that's what has happened with the issue of racism in our country over the, however long, 1800s, I think is when we actually started addressing it. But that's what's been happening. We just chop off the fruit. And for a little bit, it looks okay. But then the fruit grows back. And we're like, why is this still here? Because the target should not be that. It has to be what is going on beneath the surface. What is feeding that root? Amen. And what the word tells us is that our struggle, not one of our struggles, our struggle, the struggle, is against an enemy that is not of this world. It is not against a person. I can't solve this problem by trying to change people. It's not going to work. And I'm saying this to our body and to the church because we have to realize that, I, listen, I'm not saying don't do these things. You need to, we need to take action. We need to. We need to stand up for what is right. But we have to be in the dark even, praying for what is going on beneath the surface that not everybody else sees. Amen? We need to be. This says our struggle is not a person. Our enemy is not a person. And what is going on right now in our nation is because everyone hates everyone. We're all fighting each other. But this tells us that each other, others are not my enemy. People are not my enemy. And so when I, listen, you think the enemy wants that. Yeah, he does. I think Paul tells tells the, the, the Ephesians here that our struggle is not against flesh and blood, not to just say it's not, but to say don't make it that. Amen? Don't fight with flesh and blood. Don't struggle against them. Understand that there's something going on. There's a spirit behind everything. Like, I, I'm, I'm going to get a little weird on you this morning, but it's the truth. My grandma might come out of me. Like... <laughs> 
<laughs> Everything's demonic, right? <laughs> she never said that, but... <laughs> but the thing is, until we get that our enemy is not a person, we're not going to beat racism. Until we get that our enemy is not a person, we're not going to beat violence. We're not going to beat division. We're not going to beat church splits until we get that our enemy is not a person. Amen? Racism is the fruit of a deep root that has been killing humanity since the beginning of time. It is a fruit of a root that has been killing humanity since the beginning of time. The first recorded act of violence between people was not between a white person and a black person. It was between two brothers. The enemy... has always targeted families. Because families are the root of God's society. The family is a foundation of God's society, of his culture and his kingdom, the family. And he has not only, the enemy has not only attacked families at home, but he's attacked the family of God. He's attacked the body of Christ. Amen? Ephesians, let's look at Ephesians chapter 1. I specifically, listen, this morning it kind of came out in worship, but our goal for this thing is not to think about what needs to be solved out there. Our goal is to think about what needs to be solved in here. There is something that needs to be solved in here, and I will prove to you that that is the most important thing. Ephesians chapter 1, and I want to start with verse 18. It says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, so that you will know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of, of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe. These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Far above, everyone say far above. Far above, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion in every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. After Jesus accomplished what he did, God put him in the position above all rule and authority. And it says he put everything in subjection under his feet. And then he says, and then it says, he gave Jesus as head over all things to the church, which is his body. God put everything in subjection under his feet, under the feet of Jesus. The feet are part of the body. So God put everything in subjection under the body of Christ. Do you hear me? I'm getting somewhere with this. So the deal is, we are, we are his body, right? And the deal is, if there is... If we have not had influence on the evil that is running rampant in the world, then we are not being his body. Because God has given us the authority to suppress evil in the natural realm. When he gave Jesus authority, he gave the body authority. And I'm telling you, if there are things that are escaping from underneath my feet, then I'm not being the body. Do you hear me? God has made it clear that loving each other is equally, you might think this is wrong, but loving each other is equally as important as loving him. The word says, the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. So loving each other to God is equally as important as loving him. 
And I believe the reason the body has not been able to be the body is because we haven't been loving each other. Amen? And, and it's difficult. Listen, it's very difficult because some of us in, that might be sitting in here right now, we might be thinking, I'm, I always love the body. And I, I'm not saying that you don't. But the word says if one of us suffers, we all suffer. In other words, if one of us is falling, we're all going to fall because we're all the body. And so what we need to do during this time of prayer and fasting is, is first of all, take responsibility for what our other members have been doing and take responsibility for what we've been doing if we have contributed to it. You may think a, a, a thought is just a harmless little thing, but it will inspire attitude and action, not just action, but attitude, action, perspective, Amen? And so we can have these little thoughts and think they're harmless and be like, no, I'm good, I'm perfect, I love everybody. Or we can confront these things that bring division in the body of Christ. I brought up not so long ago, a dismembered body is not a body. Amen? And, and what, I'm telling you, what America needs right now is not just for racism to end, but for the body of Christ to start being a body. And to realize that God has put everything, every authority in subjection underneath us. So if there is evil in our nation, it's because the church is not stepping on it. Amen? Just like Cain with Abel, the enemy has worked to make the body of Christ more concerned with what they're not getting than what they're not giving. Cain killed Abel because God gave Abel favor. The word says that he had regard for Abel, and Cain killed him over that. He killed him over the favor. But the root was not more or less favor. The root was about the gift. Where it started was not that Cain didn't get enough, it's that he didn't give enough. Amen? And so what the enemy loves to do is he loves to take our focus off of what we're giving and onto what we're getting. And if we're not getting enough, then we hate our brother who is. Amen? And so I, I, another thing, I'm gonna, I have four things that I want us to target during this fasting, but we need to make sure that we're understanding that, like, like let's be asking ourselves questions like, what have I not been giving? Not what have I not been getting. Not why doesn't my church look like Bethel. Why doesn't my church look like Hillsong. Or why doesn't my husband make me dinner. <laughs> Calling you guys out. <laughs> but instead let's be thinking about what we're not giving. Amen. Amen. The reason I brought up the church thing is because the, the body of Christ is so divided because we've been so busy trying to be better than everyone else that we haven't been bettering everyone else. Like we, <laughs> comparison's been around since the garden and the enemy has been so influencing the body of Christ to compare one member to another and to fight over who's better and to get on YouTube and talk about churches and, and how they're evil and heretical and you shouldn't listen to them and whatever just to try and bring more division because in the, the root of it is that I'm jealous. We talked about that not too long ago, right? The root of it is that I'm jealous and so I'm going to compare myself to you in that way and tear you down so that you look like you're less than me. The enemy has been influencing the body of Christ in that way. And I'm going to bring up something that you might not like, but Christians, and, and let me say this before I say this. Uh, if you've gotten off social media, I don't want to condemn you this morning, but a lot of Christians, a lot of believers, I, I hear it all the time, like they stay off social media because it's just, it's just sick sometimes. It's just evil. There's just evil everywhere. People just fighting and complaining and arguing. And, and I understand it's difficult, but we're not supposed to run from evil. We need to make sure that we're trying to influence the areas that are being influenced by the enemy. I'm not saying that if you've gotten off social media, get on there, you know, 
I'm not telling you to do that. But I want us to understand, we can't just run from evil anymore. We can't just say, it's affecting me too much. I can't do this. It's, it's just bringing me down. Because we're supposed to be stronger than that. The world is not supposed to be affecting us. We're supposed to be affecting the world. So maybe if you do take a step back, take a step back and try and figure out, why am I so affected by this? Instead of realizing the authority that I have in Jesus and affecting what I see. Right? And let, and let that turn you around. And, and I had to bring that up because I literally, especially right now, I've been hearing so many believers say, I just have to stay off of it because I can't stand it. What happens when everybody, every believer gets off of it? It just gets worse and worse. And I guarantee you it's getting worse because everyone's getting off of it. We need to be a voice everywhere. On every platform, there needs to be a believer on every platform, in every city, in every state. There needs to be a believer that is speaking and standing up for what God is saying and for what God wants. Amen? Again, I'm not condemning you, but I want to encourage you in that. I even, um, the, 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 the really sad thing is that unbelievers see the division in the body of Christ very clearly. I even was just on this morning, and I read a comment from somebody that said, you Christians can't ever accomplish much because you're always attacking each other. I read that this morning. And if he says, you Christians, then he, he's not a Christian. So unbelievers see that, and that isn't helping either, <laughs> right? Now, I'm not, what, what can really tend to be our, our issue with something like this is we can see the problem and how big it is and how massive, massive it is, and we can think, even if I do get on there and say something, or even if I do stand up for what I believe, it's not really going to make much of a difference. And then we just continue to sit down, Right? We just continue to not influence anything. But the world is like doing the opposite. They're saying this is a big problem, but if we all take responsibility for ourselves, then we'll tackle this thing. They don't even have Jesus because all we really have to think, the only perspective we really need to have is, yeah, the problem is big, but God's bigger. That's the only perspective we need. Even if it's just one of us going forward and trying to influence the, uh, it, any platform, any, any area in the world, any, any form of culture in the world, we're still making a difference. Amen? I promise you, one Christian in a room of 100 unbelievers is still a lot bigger than 100 people because of who is inside of them. So you affect things, whether you think so or not. Everywhere you go, you affect things. You influence things. You have such heavy influence in the world because God gave you, you authority, not them. Amen? So why are we fasting? Number one, we need Jesus. We already went over that. That's number one. We need Jesus in our nation. If you want to think about it like this, God put everything in subjection under the feet of the body. And the feet are supposed to be shod with the gospel. God put everything in subjection underneath the gospel. So if we need Jesus, that means we need to be preaching the gospel. You hear me? Number two, we need our faith to increase. And that's obvious. Because hopelessness, doubt, and fear are too prevalent in our thoughts and our vocabulary. Wouldn't you agree? They're, they're way too prevalent. So we need our faith to increase. Number three, we need restoration in families. Again, healthy, unbroken families are the key to a healthy society. They always have been. We need to be praying that God intercept broken families and broken people. And number four, we need unity in the body of Christ. I think a lot of, a lot of unity just comes down to me saying that I need what you have. 
I want what you have. And that's part of my heart behind wanting to have local pastors come into our church and use our pulpit because I do want what they have. The more I'm, I'm out there and the more I have conversations with other leaders, the more I realize we're actually not that different. We're not as different as I thought we were whenever I was saying that we were different and I would never talk to you, right? That's how I start thinking and then I start, they start saying things and I'm like, I need to hear that. And if I need to hear it, we all need to hear it, <laughs> right? So number one, we need Jesus. Number two, we need our faith to increase. Number three, we need restoration in families. And number four, we need unity in the body. And I think that if we can just focus our prayers on, not just on these things, but let's just make sure we focus our prayers on these things specifically. And you have to believe that prayer is powerful. You have to. And again, the reason we're fasting is so that it can change the way that we pray. Um, I think it was John Piper, he says that fasting is a prayer intensifier. And he, I think he's right. I think it's a good way of putting it. Um, but let's, let's stay. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this message by Pastor Josh Cotts. We pray it blesses and encourages you throughout the week. If you'd like to know more about Living Word Church and the ministries associated with it, please visit our website at livingwordshawnee.org.